Well, it is an honor to have you back here at home with us uh, in this friendly crowd. Thank you. Um, to, to speak to one of the greatest basketball players uh, of all time. Uh, the greatest. And you are in the, one of the best films of all time, Airplane. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> so we're <laughs> absolutely some well, you know, in a, a, airports that works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, all sorts of things tonight. Uh, Coach Wooden, of course, basketball. Wilt Chamberlain, um, Dancing with the Stars. Um, but but first, I want to talk to you about this this wonderful book, um, Becoming Kareem, and. If the first line of a book sort of foreshadows a theme of a book, um, you make it clear that race will feature prominently in, in this book. Your first line is, I didn't realize I was black until third grade. And I, I wonder how you came to that realization <laughs> and, and then um, what that meant. Well, um, I think the whole issue of, of race is, is something that uh, you don't know very much about until you start to learn a few things about how we interact with each other. So uh, in third grade, uh, one of the kids in, in my school had a Polaroid camera, he brought it to school, and we all crowded up in the front of the classroom and none took a picture of us. And then they passed the picture around. And it was at that point that I noticed that uh, I was the only black kid in the class, you know? It's, and I, but uh, by that time, racial issues had intruded enough to where I didn't just see myself as an American kid, but I was a black kid. And that had a, a special connotation and, and a special kind of, uh, there were certain circumstances that went along with that designation that weren't always uh, pleasant. Mm -hmm. You eventually talk about the fact that two things would define who you were at a certain point, height and race. Yeah, they did. Uh, you know, my height and my athletic ability enabled me to, uh, to do some really good things for myself, and, and race could be uh, a very, very prickly issue. Yeah. With that uh, theme of, of race as a backdrop, um, before we get too deep into the book, and, and there are some wonderful stories that we're going to talk about in this book, uh, I want to ask you about two items in the news tonight, um, and, and they speak to where we are as a nation, I think, uh, when it comes to race. Two things happened today. One, Starbucks closed down all of its stores for racial sensitivity training. 8,000 stores closed for the afternoon in response to an incident in Philadelphia in which two African-American men were arrested for trespassing, and their crime was waiting for a friend. Uh, and they hadn't bought a cup of coffee. The second thing that happened today is the cancellation of the TV show, Roseanne, following her racist tweet. She, she, if, if you don't know what happened, because it all happened today, Roseanne Barr woke up this morning and tweeted about Valerie Jarrett, the senior advisor to the first black president of America, Barack Obama. And she tweeted, quote, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals VJ, Valerie Jarrett. ABC and the, and the parent company Disney immediately, or within a few hours, canceled the show. ICM dropped Roseanne Barr as a client. Roseanne has been roundly condemned. But as, a, as this was happening today, I was thinking about the the racism that you experienced and that you write about. And as a high school student under Coach Donahue, even before that, as a college student, an incident that happened just around the corner from here at a, at a restaurant with Coach Wooden called the Bat Rack, which I'll ask you about shortly. But I wanna ask your thoughts on those two things today. Starbucks, the fact that there is a need for this major corporation to have a day like this, uh, and two, what happened with Roseanne? <clears throat> well, uh, with regard to what happened to Roseanne, I, I was so happy to see that uh, ABC had the courage and the insight to immediately cancel the show. Uh, just to, to have that attitude 
and uh, that type of, uh, they, they, they didn't hesitate. And uh, I, I think that that's wonderful. I think it's such a, a great example uh, for how these things have to be dealt with uh, uh, straight up. You know, we can't equivocate on it. We have to like deal with it straight up. And they, I think ABC really sh showed some courage and uh, uh, it's, it's gonna cost them. Uh, this is their best show this year. And they, they still had the, uh, the wherewithal to uh, say, no, we, we, we're not gonna tolerate someone with that type of attitude doing this type of thing. Uh, and we didn't care about that. That, that, that to me was, uh, that was first rate. And things like that have given me a lot of uh, encouragement ever since uh, you know, the presidency of, of Donald Trump when uh, they had the Nazi march in Charlottesville last year. And uh, Mr. Trump made those ridiculous statements. And from across the country, from one end to the other, one corner to the other, from New England to California, from Washington State to, to Florida, Americans said, that is not America, that is not our country. And uh, that, that's what's giving me um, encouragement because I know that uh, what, what has evolved here, that uh, all Americans should be treated equally and given the same opportunity to enjoy and benefit from being here in America, we really mean that as a people. Uh, that, that came from people of all ethnicities, uh, all socioeconomic backgrounds, that uh, what uh, Mr. Trump was talking about, uh, you know, with Nazis marching in the streets, that's not the America that, that they subscribe to, and that's not the America that they're going to support. And um, I, I felt very good about that. Um, and about the Starbucks situation with these two young men who, and this was one that was videotaped and, and got a lot yeah. of attention. And so that helped to bring attention to the situation. But uh, I don't need to tell you, it's probably not the first time that it's happened. No, but you know, it, it's, uh, these situations are, are very interesting because people can use what is a very neutral uh, law, uh, worrying about somebody uh, with bad intentions uh, loitering in your place of business. But uh, most white people go into Starbucks and, and spend hours without being uh, asked to move along. Um, it's only when uh, you look like you don't fit in that uh, you get this negative attention. And um, it all has to do with uh, intolerance. Um, but people can hide their, their racist motives by saying, uh, oh no, these, these people were loitering, they, they didn't buy any coffee. Um, it's uh, a way of uh, uh, being racist by using the law uh, and uh, being able to keep your own bigotry uh, under wraps. Uh, th this happens a lot. Uh, I, I just read an article in the New York Times today about how it was used in uh, uh, various jurisdictions that had beaches, where only the, the local people had permits to go to the beach, but white, white people from outside of the neighborhood could go to the beach and not be uh, questioned, but if you were black and you went to the beach, they would come and ask you if you had the correct uh, uh, qualifications uh, to, to use that beach, and they, they'd ask you to leave, and uh, it was perfectly legal. Um, you've been writing about these things, speaking about them, living them with a dignity and a grace through your whole life. And I wonder if you feel that things are better than they were when you first started speaking about these things and writing about these things. Things are better because we now have the, the, the means to uh, combat them legally. Uh, it took the, the civil rights uh, movement to, to achieve that. But uh, as we can see, uh, these issues are, are still a problem. Um, the, the young men that got uh, arrested in Philadelphia, uh, some, someone doesn't know what, what's going on. They have to call the people who are sanctioned by the state to use deadly force to deal with the issue. Uh, that, that's how... Uh, how often it is done that way, and, that, and that's why we have this disparity in the way that uh, 
black Americans are routinely treated much harshly by the police and the criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's guaranteed to happen, and it's guaranteed to be uh, of comfort uh, to people who are, are bigoted. Um, you talk about the first sting of racism that was directed toward you at about the age of nine years old at Holy Providence Boarding School. And you say that, ironically, the racism came not from kids or teachers who were white, but from other... Other oh, black kids. Black kids. Yeah, because it was a school uh, for, for black kids. And uh, already the corrosive, uh, the, the, the corrosive atmosphere of life in America had already uh, put us against each other. Uh, black Americans have to compete against each other for a minimum of opportunities and resources. And uh, that resentment is uh, fostered by the system. Um, let me jump ahead to high school, to Power Memorial Academy in Manhattan, coached by Jack Donahue. And before we get to what you call the greatest betrayal that you experienced, um, what did Coach Donahue first bring to your life at that point in your life? Uh, Coach Donahue was a wonderful human being, and, and you know, I, I don't, it is not my purpose to portray him as a villain, because he's not, but um, he lost his temper and said something very regrettable that came across as a betrayal to me, uh, just because I was uh, being a, a cocky 16-year-old uh, and uh, not doing my job on the basketball court, and he, he wanted to shock me into you know, getting serious and focusing and stop acting like a, like a kid being a jerk. And uh, he used the N-word. And it, it really ruined a lot of trust that, I had, that we had built up between us. Uh, but it was not, he didn't say that because he was a racist. He, he made a mistake in judgment using that word uh, in, in trying to get me out of being uh, a acting a fool, as my mom would say. <laughs> <laughs> but but to, to button that story up, you, you, you finished high school, you, you continued to play for Coach Donahue, I believe for two more years yeah. at that point. Um, you weren't close, and you left for UCLA. And it was only years later when you were with Coach Wooden at his home that you had a reconciliation. And, and I wonder, it, I'll ask you to tell everyone that, that about that moment, but and well, why don't we start there? I, if you could share that moment with everyone, and then well, we'll, I'll ask um, you. Uh, Coach Wooden asked me to come by, and uh, I'd been, you know, coming by to, to, to hang with Coach and, and visit with him ever since his wife died. You know, a number of the guys on the team wanted to keep an eye on Coach and just let him know that we were there for him. And while I was at Coach's house, uh, Coach Donahue called. And it was like, wow, you know, and I wanted to talk to him. And uh, Coach encouraged me to talk to him. And, you know, I, while I was there, I, I mentioned, you know, what had happened so many years before. And Coach just asked me a question. He, he said, uh, have you ever made a mistake, Kareem? And I certainly had, and I absolutely understand what I, I just mentioned earlier, that uh, Coach Donahue was not uh, the, the villain there. He, he made a mistake. So uh, in speaking with him, I said, well, why don't we hook up later? And Coach uh, Donahue came by my house uh, that, uh, that evening. Uh, we buried any mm. animosities that, that, that we might have had. Uh, he had a shot of Bushmills with my dad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and th that's how we left it. And you know, within two years, he, he had passed away. He had, uh, prostate cancer and uh, passed away, but I was, I was very happy that um, we got that done and put that to rest, and that that was uh, absolutely a thing of the past at that point. Uh, and, and that's what I wanted to ask you, was that once you had that conversation with him, I would imagine a weight was lifted off of you, and he must have known all these years why you were upset with him. And Yeah, yeah, and... Uh, I think he just didn't know how to fix it. And I didn't know how to fix it. Mm. 
uh, I didn't bother with it because it, you know, it probably was uh, something I had relegated to, to my past. Mm. But it was something that really needed to be uh, dealt with. And uh, Coach Wooden had that type of insight, you know, to say, you know, the, you guys got to put that uh, away because uh, we had so many positive things that we shared and uh, so many wonderful things that happened to us uh, because of our association. Yeah. Let's stay in high school. Before your senior year, you went to work as a reporter. Yes. <laughs> with the uh, Heritage uh, Teaching Program, the Harlem Youth Action Project. Right. And much of the learning happened at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and you wrote, Malcolm X's Nation of Islam, which advocated an aggressive by any means necessary approach to achieving racial equality, was at odds with the strict nonviolence advocated by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I was still, try still trying to decide where I stood. And I wonder, that summer of writing and learning from Al Calloway and Dr. John Henrik Clark, how did it inform how you did deal with that question? Well, for, for me, just uh, having the opportunity to understand why I should be proud of my people and what they have given to America, uh, that, that was the, the best aspect of, of, of that summer because um, I did not, even though I was born and raised in Harlem, I didn't understand how important it was to black Americans as, as, a, as an outpost of what we could accomplish as, as a people. And uh, that summer changed my, my perspective on that dramatically. Mm. And I, I understood why it was important that uh, people like Langston Hughes and Louis Armstrong and County Cullen and Duke Ellington and people like that uh, had come to Harlem and thrived and had their art and their, um, uh, their literature, their poetry, uh, paintings and sculpture go ac around the world as uh, examples of what black Americans uh, could achieve. Mm. Um, so that, that really was what was so special about that summer for me. Because it connected me with the community in a way that uh, really changed my life. Did you ever think about becoming a journalist instead of a basketball player? I thought about that uh, at the same time as I thought about becoming a <laughs> basketball player and kind of pursued it uh, that summer. And, uh, and coming to UCLA uh, and, and dealing with Coach Wooden, Coach Wooden uh, encouraged us to be scholars and athletes. He said there was no reason why that, that could not be achieved. In fact, the way he recruited you, you write about the fact that it was very different from the way other coaches tried yeah, to recruit well, you. Well, you know, in, all right, 1965, most, most coaches would have given an arm, a leg, or a favorite child to get me to come to their school. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's just a fact. And um, the co Coach Wooden, um, when I went to meet him for my first meeting, I, I got here on a Friday night. My, I met with Coach Wooden Saturday morning. And he, we start talking, and I, I'm thinking, I'm, well, if I come to UCLA, I'm going to be playing a lot of basketball. And the first thing he starts talking to me about are my grades. And he says, you know, you have, you have very good grades here. You, you're a good student, you, you should do well at UCLA, and um, you won't have any problem graduating. We talked about that for about 20 minutes, and he said, Let, let's go get some lunch. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> the, the basketball program, you know. That, <laughs> those, those, that, that round ball, you remember? You guys? <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was refreshing, and uh, I, got, I got a letter from Jackie Robinson. I got a letter from uh, Dr., Dr. Ralph Bunch. Uh, saying that UCLA was a great academic in institution. And they, uh, my experience was that they were never proven wrong. Yeah, and education was such a driver in your life from childhood. Your father was a, a Juilliard uh, trained transit cop. Right. Uh, you, your, your mother was, talked about education all the time. So and that, my, that the, was the real, the real person behind all, most of that was my grandmother. Mm. My family's from the West Indies, you know, and uh, West Indian people really value education. Uh, so many of them leave the islands and come to America and, and get great jobs. And uh, I, I remember her saying that uh, uh, her grandchildren would not become ignorant wretches. Uh, <laughs> she used that, that kind of Victorian English, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we talked about John Wooden, and I want to return to him in a moment, but there was another figure that came into your life while you were still in high school, which seems incredible to me that at the age of 17, you became pals with Wilt Chamberlain. Right. Actually, I, I met Wilt when I was 14. Oh, 14. Uh, it was right before I started high school that, that summer, and um, he was playing in the, in the Rucker tournament. And uh, I went out there, and one of my friends who didn't know him either, but he just introduced me to him like he knew who he knew. <laughs> you know? But uh, I, I would see Wilt because uh, he had a nightclub in Harlem, and sometimes we'd see him, and he knew who I was. And then when I had this summer uh, working at uh, the Harlem Youth Project, it was right around the corner from his nightclub. So I'd see him, he'd go into the gym and work out, Miles Davis worked out in there also. Wow. It was like all these people that you know I thought were really cool. Yeah. So I, I'd go into the into uh, his nightclub sometimes or into the Y while he was uh, while he was working out. And I, I, it was great for me to have an opportunity to see what a professional athlete how, how great his life could be. You know, he he had a Bentley, all these pretty ladies that were always calling and <laughs> coming around and. He dressed so well, and you know, he just uh, he was living the life, and uh, it kind of gave me an idea of uh, maybe I could uh, get get to that point if I, if I could improve my game enough. Right. Um, let's talk about John Wooden. Um, we talked about the way he recruited you. Uh, you you decide to come, and you show up for the first day of practice, and the coach comes in this this legend. And what is the first lesson? that you guys learn? Well, you know, everybody tells the story about how, how he, to, about putting on your socks. Right. But I, I, I was never there when he gave that lecture. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, because that's part of the lore. It <laughs> is, and it, it, he did that a lot of times, but I, I just, for some reason, I, I missed those. So did you have blisters all through UCLA? No, I didn't have any blisters, <laughs> and, um, I, I got the daily uh, lecture at practice, and that was quite sufficient. <laughs> um, uh, he, he, he got the message across about preparation, uh, and one of his favorite sayings was, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. He stole that from Benjamin Franklin, but um, <laughs> he, he really explained it to us uh, on a daily basis and uh, made us aware. And, helped us learn how to focus. You wanted to get away from your parents and the, the sort of the control that they were exerting over your young teenage life as many young men do. I have two. Every 18 year old yeah. thinks he's at least 32. That's right. And, and he's ready, ready for life and ready for all these movie starlets and big money to come into right. his pockets, you know. I've got, a, I've got a 17 and a 21 year old, so I know what you're saying. Um, but you arrive here and you talk about the fact that you felt right at home and, and you got to meet some of these people that you were talking about and you met Muhammad Ali at a party. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that experience. Well, you know, the first time I saw Muhammad Ali, he was on Hollywood Boulevard doing magic right. tricks. <laughs> just, just by himself, right? Just by himself in, in, at night doing magic tricks with people walking by. I was with a couple of my friends and we were like, that's Muhammad Ali, man. <laughs> But two weeks later, I, I was at a party, um, and uh, one of the guys that plays for the, for the Dodgers gave a party, and Muhammad Ali came. And I got to meet him. He's just a, a great guy and uh, very friendly. Uh, we, we posed for a picture, like faking like we were playing instruments and stuff. But just kind of someone that you kind of look up to like your, like your big brother. And I, I had always, o always admired him from when I was in high school. When he was, he, he made Sonny Liston chase him around his his camp. Uh, you know, if somebody comes to your camp and he heckles you, you. You have to be above it and have some dignity and not be perturbed. <laughs> Sonny Liston chased Muhammad Ali. <laughs> couldn't catch him. Looked like a fool, and then got in the ring with him and got knocked out. <laughs> I had to love him. You know, Muhammad Ali was incredible. And um, <sighs> when he he got into the trouble with the. Uh, with the federal government, uh, you know, I wanted to help him. That's why I was involved in, in the summit. But he, he, he was that kind of guy, you know, he, 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 you had to like him. Uh, he was all for uh, black Americans being treated well and 
that, that, that resonated with me. And also he was friends with Malcolm X, who I respected also because uh, he had a no-nonsense approach to, to civil rights uh, activism also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I respected them because uh, they wanted to call it what it was. They, they didn't want to try to, uh, uh, you know, gloss it over. They, they, they spoke about uh, the bad aspects of, of racial relations in, in, in real terms, and, and that was important at that time. Um, and in terms of bad moments, um, I, I mentioned the, the incident that happened around the, the corner here at the restaurant that no longer exists, but um, you were standing in the parking lot with, with, with Coach, Coach Wooden. Wooden. Yeah, and um, a, a gray-haired old lady came up to Coach Wooden and asked him how tall I was, and he, he told her. And, uh, you know, she was on her way out and she, her car came up, but she said she, she'd never seen a nigger that tall. And, it, it, you know, I had negative things like that. I'd heard that before, so I wasn't rocked by it. But it, uh, it really bothered Coach Wooden. And I was surprised. You know, I, I thought he knew more about how those things uh, affected the lives of black Americans, but he didn't. And uh, as our relationship developed, you know, and, and he saw some of the things that I had to deal with, it, it really uh, gave him uh, much better insight a, a, as to what black Americans have to experience uh, for dealing with, uh, with, ra with racism. It, it, you described that, that sort of awkward drive uh, leaving the restaurant after that incident had happened and how there was a, a long period of silence. As if a long period of silence. I was stung and Coach Wooden was shocked and he, he wanted to uh, console me or, you know, deflect some of the uh, obvious pain that I, I was experiencing, but he, he didn't have the words for it exactly, and he tried to, uh, he tried to soft pedal it, uh, but I, I understood what he was doing, and um, as time went on, um, he, he, he got better insights in, into why the, the civil rights movement was, was necessary. Yeah. Um, back to Muhammad Ali for a moment. When you decided to uh, become a Muslim, did, was he a part of that conversation? Was he someone who guided you in any way? No, Muhammad Ali didn't because uh, at the time he was in the black Muslims and they were talking, they had a racist theology and uh, I was not going to be affected negatively by white racism and then go and join some black racists. Uh, that's not, to me, that's like just going to another part of the boiling kettle. <laughs> I want to get out of that kettle and uh, talk about treating uh, people, as Dr. King mentioned, on, on the basis of their character and not on the color of their skin. I, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. And that really was the uh, message that I got from Islam. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad spoke about the need to... Uh, for all people to get along and uh, know each other and uh, interact in positive ways. Mm. And uh, that, that message uh, meant, a, meant a lot to me. When he um, changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, people were offended by it. Yeah. Um, some uh, journalists refused to call him Muhammad Ali. Did you experience any of that? No, I didn't. And uh, I think they, the hostility that Muhammad Ali uh, received had to do with the fact that the black Muslims had a racist theolo uh, mm. theology. They called white people devils and uh, said that uh, if you were white that you were an evil person. Um, uh, good and evil come in all, co all colors. Uh, the, it, good and evil uh, exist in any culture that you can name. It doesn't matter. Uh, there are good and bad people f from, from every e ethnic group. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that's the way to live and the correct way, and uh, th that's what I learned from Islam. Um, the, the, the book sort of stops before the Lakers. So if you're looking for the inside story <laughs> of the Lakers, I don't want to not sell the book for you, but <laughs> that's not what the book is about. Um, you're welcome to ask those questions, and I'm going to ask a couple here, but um, just so we're clear, that's not what 
<laughs> what this book is about. This is about becoming Kareem, not Kareem number 33. Um, but you've written 14 books, right? Yeah. And so that story has been, is out there in one form or another. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about this, this debate over who is the greatest of all time. <laughs> right. Now, they, you know, with with the the finals coming up, of course, LeBron is has carried his team into the the finals once again. There's no doubt he's a great player. There's no doubt Michael Jordan's a great player. There's no doubt a whole bunch of people are a great player. But those two guys get mentioned over and over again in the goat conversation. People who are in basketball say you're the top guy. It's true. Thank you very much. I think it's 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 just a fact. And you know, you can look at the numbers, six time MVP, two time finals MVP, nineteen time all star, fifteen time all NBA selection, rookie of the year, Hall of Fame. And oh yeah, more points scored than anyone ever, 38,387. Michael, Michael Jordan's about, what, 6,000 points short of you? Yeah. I think? yeah. <laughs> Not that anyone's counting. And, but, but, but my question to you is, is when that debate happens and your name isn't included in that debate, it has to be annoying, at least. Uh, it, it would be if, if uh, I didn't have the understanding that I have that a lot of people lack perspective. Or, or <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I remember when Scotty Pippen was advocating for, for Michael, and I mentioned that, you, did you hear about some guy that scored 100 points in a game and got a lot more rebounds than Michael and uh, played the game differently? And uh, I was referring to Will Chamberlain. And um, Scotty Pippen wasn't aware of Will's statistics and ha had no idea. Let me mention, uh, and just yesterday, I, I mentioned about Bill Russell okay, talking about uh, LeBron getting to the finals eight times in a row. Bill Russell took his teams to the finals eight times in a row between 1958 and 1966, and they won the NBA championship every time. Mm. Uh, so that's eight <laughs> NBA titles in a row uh, that Bill Russell led his team to, and people are totally unaware of it and don't appreciate it, they, they didn't get there because of Bob Cousy's assist, although he was the great assist man. They didn't get there because of Bill Sharman's free throw shooting, although he led the league in free throw shooting. They got there because Bill Russell dominated the defensive end of the court and you couldn't score near the basket. And that's why his teams were able to win eight NBA championships in a row. Now, when Stefan and those guys, or LeBron, win their fifth championship in a row, Come and get me, but I think I'm going to be under the ground uh, <laughs> at, at that point. Uh, <laughs> 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 that, that's how I see it. I mean, uh, <laughs> some of the people. Uh, George Mikan. He's a, he, people don't even consider, they never saw him play. He didn't play on television. They don't know anything about him. They don't know anything about Oscar Robertson's early career. Uh, there's so many really great players. Elgin, geez, they just made, uh, had a statue mm -hmm. 40 years too late, uh, 40 years after he retired, and they finally get the statue. And Elgin could have played in, in this, in this uh, day and age, and they wouldn't have been able to guard him just like they couldn't guard him back uh, when he played. Uh, Elgin got 60 or 70 points uh, a number of times uh, back in the 60s. And, uh, you know, people just aren't aware of it. And they couldn't guard you. And, and you were, you had it, you had both things. You had the finesse and the strength at the same time. Right. And, and you were draining buckets. But it, it, it seems to me there's almost like a, a built-in discrimination against the centers. They tried, they banned dunking because of you. Right. 
I, I think it ha has so much uh, more to do with the style. Uh, LeBron's style and Michael's style is so athletic and uh, dramatic. And you know, us longer guys, we don't look as spectacular, but we <laughs> we get the job done. Right. So uh, I think that they're judging it more on style than content, and uh, you have to deal with that. That's human nature. Yeah, you talked about it in airplane. Yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me ask you about airplane because it, it really is it is one of my all time greatest films. I, 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 if it's on, I stop and I watch it because it, it just cracks me up. Was, was that a fun experience? Yeah, it was fun. It was, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm working with Peter Graves every morning. I come in, I'm sitting next to Peter. Wait, Mission Impossible? <laughs> Jimmy Walker's on there. Uh, people that you don't expect. And, you know, I, I saw it. I took my kids. They gave me a screening. And I knew I was going to like it because we go to the screening, and there, my face is 30 feet high on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you got to like that, and, you know. And uh, I'm in a movie with Ethel Merman. <laughs> oh. So, you know, and it, enab it enables me, when Shaq wants to, wants to heckle me, I, I said, all my movies are better than any of that crap that you <laughs> And he has to shut up. <laughs> so, being able to tell Shaq to shut up with, with facts like that is, <laughs> you don't know how, how, how good it makes me feel. You played with a, a, a lot of players, college and pro. Um, let me put you on the spot and ask you, who are your favorite teammates? Well, of, of course, uh, Urban and James Worthy, uh, Norm Nixon. Uh, I played with Oscar. That was an incredible experience. Uh, I played with a guy in Milwaukee that was not appreciated much, but he was a great guy and got the job done. Who knows how he did it? Greg Smith played power forward uh, when we won the uh, championship in, in, in Milwaukee. He's 6'4", power forward, and could... could that's, that's a point guard today. Uh, yeah, and, he, and uh, Gus Johnson and Dave DeBusher and guys like that couldn't handle him because he could run the court and he, he could rock and roll with them at... Uh, giving away uh, three inches and 20 pounds. It, he was an amazing guy, a good friend. Um, so it, it's guys like that that I, that I really appreciate. And uh, because it, without your teammates, uh, your life and your career ca can't be what it was. No matter how much you give, it's always the sacrifices of guys, you know, that uh, they come to play the game and, and love the game and they're your friends and your teammates. You know, uh, guys like Michael Cooper, who didn't have a whole lot of uh, 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 acknowledged mm -hmm. uh, uh, contributions, but for our team, he was indispensable. Yeah. You know, guys like that, you really appreciate it. Because you, the players see the game in a way that the rest of us don't, I think. You right. see what's happening in a way that we don't. We say, oh, that guy got 35 points, so he's the most valuable guy. But it's the people who facilitate. Who right, work. and the guys that uh, make you work hard and practice, and then the guys that come and spell you and, and give you that moment, of, uh, those three or four minutes of rest that enable you to come back out a little bit fresher and able to, 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 to bring home the bacon. All, all of the things, uh, you really appreciate that. Uh, I, I think that's what team, team sports are about. Yeah. Um, Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, they called, uh, you know, about two months ago, and, and my, my agent, Deborah, she said, uh, this is a star call. You don't want to do that. I said, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> no, I want to do that. I, I, I'd seen Derek Fisher and uh, Emmett Smith, and I thought they, you know, they acquitted themselves pretty well. Emmett won it. Yeah. And unbeknownst to most people, I, I, I learned how to dance a little bit when I was in grade school and high school, and I, I thought maybe I'd give it a shot, so... That, that's what it was all about. And you were telling me backstage that these days, people obviously still come up and ask you about basketball, but many people know no, you I from have, Dancing Since I've done Dancing with the Stars, it's a totally different group of people. <laughs> a lot more ladies come up to me in the, in the supermarket and say, you look wonderful. And so it's, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> I had to show for us baby boomers that, you know, we're not sitting around waiting to die, that 
we're living and uh, we're not uh, just sedentary and, and let, giving it over to the, to the next generation. Yeah. Um, I believe you're a cancer survivor for 10 years now? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine who has leukemia uh, asked me to ask you, um, does it interfere with your daily life and did it make you change anything in your life or your outlook on life? Well, um, it, it doesn't in interfere in my, my life that much. Uh, I was very fortunate that the type of leukemia I have can be treated. It certainly has enabled me to, uh, to pri prioritize my time now and make sure that I do the things that need to be done and that are important to me. I had a very good friend, uh, Bruno Kirby. Uh, I don't know if you guys, everybody saw him when Harry met Sally. He, he's Billy Crystal's uh, sidekick. And we went to high school together. And he, he died, he was diagnosed and died within a month of being diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I thought that that's what I was dealing with. And um, when it worked out that uh, I, I had a chance to to survive it, you know, it, it, it's really made me appreciate the, uh, the moments that I have left and uh, I'm making sure that uh, I connect with the people that are important, my, my kids. I have a granddaughter now. Congratulations. Uh, she's, uh, she's incredible. She's probably the boss now. <laughs> uh, but uh, those types of things uh, have uh, really, they, they help you appreciate the moments that you have. Hmm. I wonder if it, it also, for lack of a better word, softens you in some way. Because I, I feel like people have this impression of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as this guy who is tough, aloof, quiet. Um, has it changed that part of you? Well, you know, I, I was always shy. And, you know, being tall, you, you're always, you always stick out. So that, that makes you even more reticent to do too much to draw attention to yourself. So. Uh, it, it's better for me that I, I live my life and, and let, it, let it go because uh, every, every moment counts and uh, we have to enjoy those moments and uh, we can't spend a whole lot of time worrying about uh, how we look. Uh, yeah. We just got to go ahead and, and live life and just smile and enjoy it. Every moment does count and I know that we want to get you on your schedule so let's take some questions from the audience. Ted is there with the mic. Yes, and just a quick reminder, when it comes to questions at Live Talks Los Angeles, they typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are short. We do not believe in two-part questions. Only Frank <laughs> Buckley gets to ask follow-up questions. And our first question for the evening. Okay. Uh, first of all, good evening, Mr. Jawar. Uh, good my evening. Name, my name is Ramon, uh, Ramon Hamilton. And uh, first off, thank you for coming to my school. Uh, I go to school here at New Roads. And um, as well, thank you for being an, ex an excellent example for today's youth, uh, like myself. And um, I had one question, and I wanted to ask you. Uh, my uncle is a very famous jazz drummer by the name of Chico Hamilton. And I wanted to know if you've ever uh, enjoyed some of his music. Oh. Uh. I hope you say yes. I, I have enjoyed Chico's music, and I, I know uh, your relative Forrest Hamilton very well from when I went to UCLA. That's right. <laughs> nice to see you. You have a, a chapter in the new book about the impact of reading autobiography of Malcolm X. Curious if you've gone back and reread that in any recent years, what kind of impact it's had? Uh, I haven't reread it, but I really enjoyed the movie that Spike Lee uh, directed. It reminded me of uh, so many of the, uh, the uh, uh, incidents and parts of the book that uh, were very illustrative of how uh, Malcolm went through his transformation. So uh, I, I still think about that. And uh, th there's been a, a, a really good book written about uh, the relationship that Malcolm had with Muhammad Ali, which was, which was very informative. You're welcome. How's it going, Kareem? Big fan. Um, so my question comes in uh, regard to this 
characteristic uh, trait of grit. So I, I'm really curious to know uh, how you developed that early on in your life, because you said you were you know, a, a bit shy, and I think the mark of any great individual is this, is this feature of grit. So when did that really start to come to the forefront for you? When did you start to develop that? I, I think I developed my grit just trying to be a competitive athlete. While I was in grade school, I was on the, ba the baseball team, the basketball team, the swimming team, and the track and field team. And I, I just enjoyed sports and competition, and that really got me out to, to compete. You know, I, I might not have a whole lot to say, but I really enjoyed competition, and I always, I wanted to, my very first medal, uh, my very first athletic medal I got was for swimming. Um, uh, 25 meter freestyle, got a silver medal. I was so happy. I was <laughs> went nuts in uh, little league, um, and that followed uh, after baseball, basketball, and I guess uh, basketball was my niche. Thank you for your question. Thank you. First, Kareem, I want to make the comment that us tall guys, uh, you did have style with this guy hook. You had all kinds of style. Um, and as much of a fan as I am of basketball, it's a non-basketball question. Your foundation, um, you collaborate with LA Unified School District. Yes. Uh, do you have any plans to expand that to other school districts or other parts of California or throughout the United States? Uh, we would like to get the program funded so that uh, a number of other uh, school districts can get into it. Uh, but, as you know, um, money is scarce and uh, everybody is competing for every dollar. So I, I'm still just working here in Los Angeles. But we have now uh, a five to eight year waiting list and um, it's, it's, it's doing very well. So uh, I, I just hope to keep it going. Thank you for your question. Hi, Ramadan Mubarak. I just wanted to ask if there was one player that you could play with today. Hmm. Who would you play with? Uh, geez, if one player I could play with today, who would I play with? Uh, ben Simmons from the, the 76ers. He's, he's doing some amazing things out there. I never played with, I played with a, with a point forward, but his name was Magic and he, he moved to the backcourt. <laughs> Ben Simmons plays two positions at the same time, and it's unbelievable. Uh, I, I just think that the players now, their, their imaginations are, are taking the game further and further into the stratosphere. And it's an amazing thing to see. Yeah. No more questions. No, there's one. It's, it's the mic Mr. Cream, why oh, okay. did you change your name from Luel Sindor to Cream Abdul Jabbar? I changed my name when I decided I wanted to live my life as a Muslim and uh, assert my uh, Muslim identity. The name that I had prior to that was the name of someone who owned my family members uh, in the 17th and 18th and 19th century. Uh, I didn't feel that I should uh, carry that name with me or, or burden my children with it. So I chose a name, uh, an Islamic name that uh, had some meaning for me and connected me spiritually with something that was very important to me. All right, so I'm kind of nervous to ask this question because I don't want to bring up any hurt feelings about this, but I see like a lot of people like YouTubers and you know just basketball players in general using terms like pasty white boy and white boy to describe white basketball players. Um, and I'm a pretty good basketball player, if I do say so myself. And it just kind of, you know, it just kind of hurts when they say, like, you can't play because you're white. Like, from your own personal experience, do you think that this is true? Oh, uh, I, I know it's not true. Uh, I have uh, good friends uh, named Gail Goodrich and Larry Bird and Kevin McHale, uh, some of whom I played with and some of whom I played against. And, whether they were white or not, they, they kicked ass. <laughs> uh, so uh, all you have to do is go out there and prove your worth a, as an athlete. It doesn't matter what color you are. Um, it, it, it never will. 
um, because it, it's all about the, the quality of your competition and not the color of your skin. And uh, you can prove that to them. Uh, black players have had to prove that to white players. Sometimes it works the other way around. Uh, you, you can make friends like that. So uh, you should try that. if you had one moment that you could pick out of all of your levels of basketball um, career, what would be the most m memorable moment for you out of your whole career? Well, uh, that's easy. Everybody in here knows that that's uh, June of 1985 when we finally beat Boston. <laughs> I think we partied a, a long time <laughs> that, that, that summer and, and really enjoyed that. I, I know I did. Uh, earlier it was, or a couple times tonight, it's been brought up about the movie Airplane. But I want to ask you about a previous movie, when you did Came to Death with Bruce Lee. And what was your relationship with him? What was that filming process like? Um, I, I trained with Bruce for four years, starting my junior year at uh, UCLA, and uh, he felt that if he ever got the opportunity to make movies, he would have some of the people that, that worked with him, uh, that worked out with him uh, in the film. And finally that happened after he got the opportunity to make movies in Hong Kong, and he invited me to come over, and uh, I'm the villain. <laughs> but it was fun. Uh, it was the last time I saw Bruce, you know, within a year of uh, us doing that uh, film, he, he passed away. So uh, I'm, I'm really glad I got a chance to do that. Uh, it's, it's a very vivid memory in my life. Thank you. You're welcome. Kareem, first let me say it's an honor to be in the same room and to even be asking you this question. <laughs> but you talk a lot about dealing with racism in your life. And given that what's been going on in this century with um, ISIS and all the um, Islamic terrorist groups, I was wondering, do you deal with Islamophobia more or less now because of it? Uh, I've had to deal with Islamophobia more uh, just because people really don't understand what Islam is uh, when they have fanatics that uh, use Islam as a, as a means to uh, uh, express their fascist tendencies uh, and their sadistic tendencies. And they, they use religion to do that. We have a group here in, in America that has done that. It's called Ku Klux Klan. Uh, they distort Christianity and say that it's something that should be used in a racist way. It's not. Uh, the same is true of Islam. Uh, and it, it takes a while before people get that uh, and understand that uh, when you have crazy people uh, or desperate people, They'll use any, any means to uh, try to express their own need to satisfy their own greed and uh, sadism. So I, I, I just say that because uh, that's what Islamophobia is, is really about. Uh, it's about crazy people that uh, cause other people to hate Islam and hate Muslims, uh, not understanding that uh, their religion is being distorted. Hi, Kareem. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. And I saw you a few weeks ago in Thousand Oaks, so I'm a groupie. Um, <laughs> as a teacher, I really am honored that you wrote this book because you have such power, more power than you probably ever anticipated off the court. If you could just speak briefly to the one and done. I'm so concerned that so many of the college students barely can put a noun and a verb together and get these billion dollar contracts. Maybe gentlemen such as you would have some influence from an educational perspective. Thank you. Uh, I, I have tried to uh, speak my piece about the futility of sending kids to college for a year. It, it, it's just an excuse to allow the athletic department to exploit their, their talent before they move on to the NBA. And I, I think it's, it's a travesty and I hope that uh, they just eliminate it and let kids go directly into the NBA or they can go into the developmental league. That would be much better than uh, wasting uh, the resources of our colleges uh, with this one and done phenomena. It uh, 
kids that don't belong in college don't belong in college. It's, that's pretty simple. And uh, unless you are academically qualified uh, and uh, belong there, I, I don't think you should go. Um, Mr. Jabbar? Um, yes. When, in the book, you said there was a girl when you were younger who was bullying you? There's a girl what? There was a girl who was bullying you in the book? Um, and you said if you hit her, you would start crying. Were you ever emotional when you were younger? Was I ever emotional? Yeah, emotional or sensitive? Well, I was always emotional when that girl used to beat me up, yeah. <laughs> One of the worst parts of my life. You know? <coughs> but I, you know, I, after I grew up, after I was 12 years old, nobody tried to tried to beat me up, <laughs> especially girls. Hello, Cream. Big Hi. time fan. I love the Skyhook, so I'm asking you about the Skyhook. Who taught you how to do it? Uh, a guy named George Haydick taught me the, the Skyhook. He, well, he didn't really teach me the skyhook. He gave me George Mikan's drill. George Haydick lives down in Carlsbad. I just found this out two years ago. He taught me this when I was in the fifth grade, and I just saw him again two years ago. He lives down in Carlsbad. It, it, it blew my mind. His son went to UCLA and played soccer. But uh, my, my grade school coach, I, I couldn't do anything in grade school. I was terrible. I would have reminded you of a newborn... Uh, Thoroughbred, you know, when they come out and they... <laughs> that was me on the basketball court, really. And uh, Coach Hopkins said, somebody has to show you how to do something. So he got George to show me the George Mikan drill, which was the drill that George Mikan used when he was at DePaul to work on his hook shot. Uh, you shoot it in front of the basket using either hand off the glass, and you, you develop the, the footwork and uh, the ambidexterity and uh, you learn how to use the glass. It's a very good drill for that. And that's all I had. So I, I just practiced that every chance I got until I, I had the drill down. Uh, Mr. Kelly, who uh, was the custodian of, of my, my grade school, gave me a key so I could get into the gym at night sometimes. Because he knew I'd put the chairs back. <laughs> and uh, I'd work on it. And uh, so by the time I got into high school, I had the mechanics down for, for a hook shot. Uh, they were very, very, uh, very ingrained in me. Bruce Lee said that he did not fear any man that practiced 10,000 kicks, but he feared a man that practiced one kick 10,000 times. And that was my one kick that I had worked on 10,000 times before I got into high school. And it served me very well in my professional career. I would not have. Able to do that. And, and let, me, let me just follow up and ask, who, who first called it a skyhook? The first guy who called it a, a skyhook was Eddie Doucette, who was the announcer for, this, for the Milwaukee Bucks. Because he, he, in seeing me, he said, geez, you released it very high in the air, he, and he started calling it the skyhook. And uh, I, I thank Eddie. That, that's his contribution to my game. And, <laughs> it, it, it's worked out. And our final question for the evening. Okay. Oh. oh. I think it's over there. Hi. Um, I, I'm a big fan of your cultural and entertainment journalistic essays, particularly um, the one that first caught my eye was the one about the HBO show Girls and recently the NFL, ch NFL cheerleaders. So I, I just appreciate you um, talking about how women are represented. And um, I don't know, I guess I was kind of curious how you, I know you're obviously an author, but how you got interested in commenting on um, entertainment criticism and if that's something you might do more of? Well, I, I felt, always oh, felt... Beverly Hills is amazing. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I was also in True Beverly Hills. <laughs> but, <laughs> the, the reason that I, I comment on some of the uh, women's issues is because of uh, what I've understood to Islam. For, for most people, they see Islam and they see how they treat women, it, it, it's, it's horrible. That's not what the Quran says. The Quran tells us that women should have, A, the right to choose their husbands. Uh, they should have the right to own uh, and inherit uh, wealth. 
and they should have the right to uh, petition for divorce if, if they're being mistreated. This does not happen in the Islamic world. It doesn't happen, and it's because uh, of the patriarchal history there. They just ignore this part, these parts of the Quran. And if you challenge them on this, they, they get very quiet and they, they, they won't engage you uh, in, in a discussion on this because they, they don't have any, any method to protect the rights of women and see to it that they are treated the way that the Quran says that they're supposed to be treated. Mm -hmm. So that's why I write about these issues, because uh, uh, I want people to, to get this, and I want Muslims to get this, that uh, um, the, the Quran was the very first book to guarantee these rights to women, and it, it's not been implemented, and it took the Constitution of the United States uh, to, to set an example for the world. And uh, I, I, that's why I'm very proud I'm an American, and as a Muslim, I, I try to identify these issues because um, it's important. It's important for my daughter.